Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at The History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and The History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join The History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with The History Guy, books behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. Today, the History Guy tells two stories of exploitation. First, he tells the story of a man who was possibly the last survivor of the Atlantic slave trade brought to the United States. Then, he tells the story of Oda Banga, a young African man brought to the U.S. who was displayed in the Bronx Zoo. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. The United States banned the importation of slaves in 1808, but we didn't ban slavery in the United States until December of 1865 with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And one of the things that means is that the vast majority of the slaves that were freed had been in the United States for many generations, and their history was largely lost to time. The dynamics of slavery means that the families had been broken up and even oral histories were largely lost. And that leaves a specific gap in the historical record because there are very few first-hand accounts of what life was like before the Middle Passage. But there is at least one extraordinary exception. Oluole Kazola, who was otherwise known as Kajo Lewis, was born in what is today Benin in West Africa around 1840, and like millions of others, his tribe was captured by a marauding tribe and sold to white slavers. And his extraordinary tale of capture and survival as one of the last slaves to be imported from Africa to the United States is history that deserves to be remembered. The United States was tearing itself apart. It was 1858, and the question of state sovereignty versus the federal government was about to come to a head in the American Civil War. Part of the issue of state sovereignty was also, of course, the question of slavery. Southern states wanted to keep slavery, seeing it as necessary for their economy. Most northern states wanted to abolish it. When the Founding Fathers drafted the Constitution, slavery in the fledgling country was already a question without an answer. In its final document, the Constitutional Congress wrote in Article 1, Section 9, that the government could not abolish the international slave trade until 1808. This compromise wouldn't stop the sale of slaves already in the U.S., but it would prevent new slaves from being transported into the country. Thomas Jefferson, who wanted the slave trade abolished, wrote, What a stupendous, what an incomprehensible machine is man, who can endure toil, famine, stripes, imprisonment, and death itself in vindication of his own liberty, and in the next moment be deaf to all those motives whose power supported him through trial, and inflict on his fellow man a bondage, one hour of which is fraught with more misery than the ages of that which it rose in rebellion to oppose. When the slaver ship named Clotilda made its voyage to transport human cargo from the infamous port of Widda to the United States in 1858, the importation of slaves had already been outlawed for 50 years. Yet they and hundreds of others did it anyway. Some historians estimate that in 1858 alone, more than 13,000 people were illegally smuggled into the United States by hundreds of ships from both the northern and southern states. Cazola was one of approximately 116 people who were transported on the Clotilda. Cazola would later tell journalists and authors, notably Zora Neale Hurston, who would go on to write such classics as Their Eyes Were Watching God, that he was 18 years old when his village was attacked by the king of the Dahomey. Prior to that fateful day, Cazola had lived a normal childhood. His grandfather was a wealthy man who served the local chieftain. Cazola told biographers that his own family didn't have the ivory by their door, which meant that they were not leaders of the tribe. Cazola was the son of the second wife of his father. His tribe practiced polygamy, with the husband's tent being situated in the middle of tents of his wives. Cazola described the marital process as being driven by the women, who would decide when and who to add to the family group. He said multiple marriages were the prerogative of the wealthy, because otherwise a man wouldn't be able to afford to feed his growing family. 
but he noted that there was a balance to be struck, because too many wives were a problem too. English wasn't his first language, but the author Hurston faithfully recorded Kazula's natural syntax in her book, Barracon, The Last Black Cargo, when he said, Some got too many wives. When you hungry, it is painful. But when the belly too full, it painful too. Kazola said his village system of justice was different than what existed in the United States. Of the latter, he would have quite a few experiences with before his death. He said when someone committed a serious crime in Africa, the village would summon the king and his officials, who would come and sit in judgment of the accused man with the village's elders. In one case that he remembered, Kazola said a man was accused and convicted of murder. As a death sentence, the king commanded the murderer be ritualistically cut on the chest and then tied with tight cords to the body of his victim and then be left there until he too was dead. The symbolism of the cut was that the man was now dead in the eyes of the other villagers who would ignore the killer's cries for mercy. Kazola said those people condemned to this punishment didn't last more than a few days because people can stand the smell of the horse, the cow, and other beasts but no man can stand the smell in his nostrils of a rotten man. In his remembrances of life in Africa to Hurston, Gazzola also recalled the death of his grandfather and the ritualistic mourning of his wives. He said the dead were buried under the ground inside the house in which they had lived in life. The widows were required to mourn for their deceased husband for two years. He said for the first year, the widows wouldn't wash their faces, except with their tears. In addition to married life, the system of justice and mourning, Gazzola said in his village there were multiple initiation rites for the young men of the tribe to undergo before they would be considered adults and worthy of taking part in the village council. Unfortunately, he was only able to do one of the initiations before his village was attacked by the Dahomey. According to Gazzola, the king of the Dahomey sent a messenger to his village leader, demanding tribute from the crops in the fields. The leader, whom Gazzola called Ikayan, refused to send tribute and said if the Dahomey spent more time growing their own crops, then they wouldn't need to demand tribute of the tribes around them. Using this refusal as a pretext, the king of the Dahomey sent his female warriors into Kasola's village at dawn and had his men surround all the exits. The slaughter of the elders in his village haunted Kasola for the rest of his life. He said the warriors chopped the heads off the people they killed and wore them on their belts. The young men and women were rounded up and taken to the seaport of Widda, where he and others were sold to Captain William Forster of the Clotilda. The Clotilda, owned by Timothy Meir, had sailed out of Alabama to Widow with the expressed intent of purchasing slaves. According to some historians, Meir had made a large bet with another man that he could import slaves without being charged for the crime. Meir and his associates were later arrested for transporting Kazula and the other slaves to America, but when the Clotilda arrived, the Africans were hidden in the Alabama swamps and the Clotilda was scuttled. Because no evidence of wrongdoing could be found, the court dismissed the case against Meir in 1861. The Clotilda's 1860 trip was among the last, by some accounts, maybe the very last, to bring African slaves into the United States. After surviving the harrowing Middle Passage with its cramped quarters and restricted food and water, Gazula said he spent over five years as a slave for James Meir, the brother of Timothy Meir. He and a few others from the Clotilda worked hard chopping wood, providing fuel for a riverboat. Kazula said the Americans couldn't pronounce his real name, so he suggested they call him Kajo, which is a generic name for a male child who was born on a Monday. Some historians believe his last name, Louis, was a corruption of his father's African name, Aluale. Kazula experienced culture shock in the United States, not just in his new reduced status as a slave, but also from the Americanized slaves, some of whom had lived in America for generations, and who seemed to him as foreign as his masters. He said he and the other Africans were mocked for wanting to dance cultural dances and for the way they talked in broken English. He described his new life as extremely hard, as he was physically exhausted all the time. When he and Mir's other slaves were freed after the U.S. Civil War had run its course, they wanted to return to Africa. They asked Mir for the money to return home, but were refused. A petition to the U.S. government was refused as well, so together the group worked and saved its money to purchase a plot of land in southern Alabama that they called Africa Town. It was only a handful of miles from Mobile, Alabama, but seemed further because it was isolated in the rural swamps. They created a society for Africans in America, built a church, and a school. Kazula entered a common-law marriage with another Clotilda survivor named Abila, whom the Americans called Celia. He said when they both converted to Christianity, the other believers told him that he and Abila should be married in a church to have their marriage sanctioned in the eyes of God. They did so, but Kazula noted, 
I don't love my wife no more with a license than I love her before the license. She a good woman, and I love her all the time. They had five sons and one daughter during their time together. Kazula gave his children both American and African names so they could understand where they came from, but also fit in in their new country with easily pronounceable names. Kazula told Hurston during one of their many interviews in the 1920s that his sons were fighters and wouldn't accept insults from anyone. He said his neighbors came to his home and told him that they thought his sons would kill someone because they were so argumentative. And he replied, You see the rattlesnake in the woods? If you bother him, he bites you. If you know the snake shall kill you, why you bother him? Same way with my boys. You understand me? Though he worried about his sons, they were not the first child Kazulu would bury. Kazula and Abila lost their daughter to an illness when she was only 15 years old. He said it broke their hearts. Another of his sons, Kujo Fishiton, was shot by a sheriff's deputy in the neck and said he shot in self-defense. Kazula brought his son home where he died. He said he mourned not just for the loss of his son and daughter, but also because his children never had the chance to see Africa, the place Kazula would always consider his home. Kazula was struck by a train in Mobile in March 1902. He said he was passing another cart in the street when he reached the train tracks and didn't see the train coming when it hit him. A lawyer was able to get a judgment for damages from the railroad for $650, but Kazula said he never saw a penny of the money. As he related to Hurston, he held no grudges about the money and considered it a miracle to have survived the accident. The people of Africatown supported Kazula by making him the sexton of the church so he was still able to earn a wage, even with his injuries. More tragedy struck when one of Kazula's sons was struck and killed by a train, and another died of illness. He and Abile lost their children to accidents or disease, one after another. When Abile died in 1908, Kazula said he guessed she had left him to go be with their children. He would outlive his entire family, except for a daughter-in-law and some grandchildren. Despite his decades away from his homeland, Kazule and the other survivors of the Clotilda expressed a hope that if they would tell their story to authors and journalists, that it would eventually be heard by their family or someone who remembered them in Africa. He talked at length about his deep sadness after the death of his family. He told a story to illustrate his plight. He said, God gave man six appendages to defend himself during his time on earth. Two feet, two hands, two eyes. If he loses his feet, he can still defend himself with his eyes and his hands. If his hands are cut off, he can still avoid the blows that are thrown at him. But if he loses his feet, his hands, and his eyes, he has no more defenses. My sons were my feet to me, my daughter my hands, my wife my eyes. I have no more defenses. Alu Ale Kazole was the last known survivor of the Atlantic slave trade between Africa and the United States. He passed away in July of 1935 at the age of 94 or 95. He is buried in Plateau Cemetery in Africatown, Alabama. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. So we, we've done a number of stories, you know, about the slave trade and about various people who were enslaved on, on both sides of the Atlantic. We've done parts in the, in the United States and in, in Africa, uh, but none of, none of the stories we've told are quite like uh, Oluwale's. Yeah. Well, the, well, there's some, it's difficult to pronounce. Yeah. Uh, there's some question <laughs> over exactly how it's pronounced, but his, I mean, what's, what's so special about his story? And it's really interesting when you hear the quotations from him, you know, the, the way that he uses language, the way that he speaks his English. But there's so very few, and he, he might be, I mean, some argue that he was the last to survive the, 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 the passage. There's some arguments there might have been somebody else, but that, that uh, this is this person that we have extensive record on, uh, who, I mean, quite a bit of interview, who survived slavery, survived the end of the Civil War to freedom, but could remember his life in Africa. It wasn't, it wasn't generation set apart from it. Uh, and that gives us a kind of a unique vision of what was going on in the Middle Passage and really what it was like to live here as an African. So few, you know, so many people were, were brought over that way, but very, very few of them uh, were, were able to write down their stories in a way that, you know, has been preserved in history. Yeah, and of course we'd, we'd outlawed the slave trade long yeah. before that, or at least the, the importation of slaves before that. And so he had to be brought in illegally. And so for, you know, the vast majority of the people that were freed, you know, with the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War, the vast majority were generations removed yeah. from actually coming across on a passage. So they had to break the law to do it. And then also that afterwards that he sat and actually had this 
very lengthy interview so that that we really got a vision of who he was and what it was like where he was and it's it's an, it's really interesting when he talks about you know how his culture worked and i mean gosh there's some there is some some vicious stuff about about the you know the ways that they would punish people and stuff in, that's right in every, yeah that was very yeah, very cruel uh i mean they had the, they had their laws and they and they followed their laws it was yeah. also interesting how uh it was, it was the dahomey but i yeah. mean how he was enslaved and how you know the the tribes treated each other yeah uh and i mean but then he also remembered because there were so many in west africa and the, i mean the cultures were all you know they were there were similarities but there were differences yeah. and that he would remember things like that it was you know, the, the women decided who got married uh, and if you were rich enough, you had multiple wives. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not positive that would be a boon to have your hut in the middle of multiple wives <laughs> yeah, that's and a... them deciding whether you get married. But apparently that's the work for him. Uh, so, I mean, it's really, I mean, that makes the story fascinating, but it also shows, I mean, it, this is a strange way to put it, but I mean, you lose some of the tragedy when you talk about someone who by the end of the Civil War, they had, you know, they had no more cultural connection. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can feel the, the tragedy of the of the transatlantic slave trade a little bit more from someone who actually never gave up wishing that he could go home yeah. and see the people it's hard to say if any of the people he loved were still around you know because yeah. they, because they, but i mean he remembered being taken from his culture and that's uh yeah i think many of us can imagine that what that might be like and and, and uh, it's so it's 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 an interesting story from so many ways it's interesting yeah. ethnographically to understand about what's clearly going to be a lost culture today i mean it, there's nobody left from his his original tribe or anything like that, uh, but it's it's also interesting because it, it really shows the impact uh, that uh, the slave trade had that, that you know being kidnapped from your home, taking the, the culture shock, coming to yeah. America, and someone who never quite accepted that to the point they kind of created his own village of, you know, those left that remembered Africa that yeah. didn't you know that that's what they wanted to to, to remember, trying to yeah. preserve it and there's there's just there's very little of that that we've we've been able to remember so much of that has been lost yeah. uh, through uh, you know through, even through um, because of the way that you know families were broken up and uh, slaves were traded and stuff throughout mm -hmm. throughout the U.S. is that you just lost a lot of that even in the uh, the the uh, Oral histories, yeah. and that's that's difficult. We're in a period where he had, there's photographs. Yeah. We're in a period where I mean, it was it wasn't voice recorded, but it was recorded well by. I mean, so it's relatively recent in terms of history, yeah. uh, and but I mean, still, you know, the whole oral history is lost. Yeah. I always wonder, had he because what he wanted to do with the people from that from the town where they wanted to do is they wanted to be returned to Africa, and I wonder if anyone had funded a ship for that. Yeah. If you if you had taken people who had been as children in Africa and 30 years removed and taken them back and, and, and you know, would, would they have found a place? I honestly don't know. It's an interesting question. And, and you know, that whole region was, uh, uh, in general political turmoil, both, you know, during the time that yeah, they were there to the, well, the way well through, after that. Yeah. Still, still in some ways today, I mean, yeah. you know, going on. So it's, I mean, it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to say what, you know, would there have been something to go back to? I, I honestly don't know. You know, I, I did. I read a story recently. the The ship that they came in on, the mm -hmm. Clotilda, mm -hmm. uh, just a few months after you posted the video in tw in twenty nineteen, uh, they they actually found it. They've they've brought up the ship with the remains of it because they burned it uh, to try to hide the evidence, essentially. Which of course the the guy ends up getting away with it, even though he had brought brought the slaves in, which mm -hmm. is an interesting uh, an interesting tale in and of itself. But I thought that was interesting that they, that we've now we've seen this. Uh, uh, archaeological record that we you know we found pieces of this history and we still continue to you know even a uh, hundred years after after he has, is mm -hmm. gone I, I think that that's one of the the lessons is that we are, we're always learning more about history mm -hmm. and I mean there's some stuff that you know we'll never get back but there's stuff we still are able to discover yeah it's uh, I mean it's it's stunning what you know I mean history that truly was forgotten yeah. that gets to be rediscovered and that and that piece of, of Kazula's history is is really fascinating yeah uh, I also thought this one was interesting because, you know, we we did a story on, on Wida and on Dahomey, and we, we, we mm -hmm. talked about the Dahomey Amazons, and I, I kind of, this is a little bit meta, I guess, but to talk about how we've, because we now have, we have such a large library mm -hmm. of episodes, it's kind of amazing how you can, you know, find these different uh, ways we've told these stories that and how they connect with each other. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in that particular case, yeah. Uh, we did an episode on the Dahoma Am Dahomey Amazons. Yeah. It was Dahomey Amazons that had attacked yeah. his village. Uh, and, I mean, those uh, two interesting pieces of history, and they just happen to intersect there, and there's a lot of different yeah. places where it does. And this, the more, I mean, we tell short history, uh, short forgotten history, but some of it makes themes that go on lengthy yeah, lengthy themes, and you know we talked about uh, Casola himself has has, a, has an interesting story too. Uh, it's it's interesting that he you know he came so late, so he actually had uh, very 
short amount of time spent, you know, actually enslaved compared mm -hmm. to uh, whole generations that were. Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, that's, I mean, and you know, it's hard to yeah, it's hard to gauge, right. you know, better words or whatever or quantify. But yeah, he he since he was one of the last that to come across. I mean, you know, even illegally at that point, then that means he didn't live a whole life of slavery. He, and, and, and his life was simply very unique. I'm not sure there's anybody yeah. quite like him. Uh, and there were there seemed to have been very few left after the Civil War who remembered being in Africa and and. Uh, uh, but he was a child when he was there, yeah. and so yeah. I mean, his setting aside everything else, everything about history and slavery in America at the time or whatever, this is a man who lived an extraordinary life. Absolutely. And there's, I mean, a good chunk of the video is talking about what happens with his wife and his children, and the, the last quotation in the video, which is very, very powerful, yeah. uh, when he talks about, you know, it was I lost all my defenses when I lost my my sons and my daughter and and then my wife. I mean, that stuff is, I mean, it's universal. It's powerful and it's touching. So, I mean, it's it's, uh, it's hard to say how different life would be if, you know, I mean, he clearly had horrible things happen to him in his life. But it's hard to say how different, but he still found that kind of peace. And in the end, he's expressing the sort of wisdom that I think can, you know, can really occur to anybody, you know, with time yeah. about what's really important in life. So I, I think in by any other standard, too, he was simply a, a, a guy who lived through a lot, who has an interesting yeah. story to tell and who ended with wisdom that I think anybody can benefit from. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, you know, because you're right, putting aside everything else, uh, it it's incredible to have his story. Yeah. And I think that, you know, p people like, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, who was recording this story, this is this has been, this is always true, is that so mm -hmm. many people, you know, have, he was an example of a fairly regular person who mm -hmm. lived, lived a life that was affected by how history was going on around him. But it's amazing how much we can learn from it. And even, you know, the way he talked, what we can learn mm -hmm. about linguistics and uh, possibly about how, how his own language worked and stuff like that. I mean, that's stuff that, that, we easily could have lost and stuff that we easily have lost and yet we were able to preserve it and I, I think it's I think it's a good reminder that we should we shouldn't take our own histories for granted that's one of the lessons how amazing that someone figured out you know how extraordinary his life was and went and got that story and we're yeah. I mean there are lots of projects right now doing that with World War II veterans there yeah. was a great project to do that with World War One veterans before they were all gone um, but I mean how many you know, how many of us have a grandmother and we've never taken the whole yeah. story? And so, I mean, this that's a value of it, too. And it's an, it's an interesting thing is just have this man that was so very interesting and have yeah. someone come down and get him to tell his whole story. And we learn things we wouldn't uh, have ever known without it. Yeah, and he's and he's really unique. And I mean, you know, the story of Africa Town too is is an interesting one. And that they mm -hmm. they didn't want to. I mean, they didn't want to stay. But ultimately, I, that that trip back to Africa is a very difficult. It was difficult mm -hmm. to make, and we'll mm -hmm. see that in the next episode that we'll talk about today too. Is that yeah. it, it was it was hard. And I like and, the, said, and there were efforts knew, to return to start colonies, yeah. and 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 they didn't always work out so easily. No, no. Yeah. Well, Liberia, I guess, is is probably the the most successful. Yeah, but Cote Cote uh, oh, yeah. Ivory Coast was also that was a British version of it. Oh, I didn't know that. One of the, one of the first uh, colonists there was a guy. His name was George Washington because he was a Minnesota <laughs> owned by George Washington. But wow. uh, so those are uh, Liberia was an American effort. Uh, Ivory Coast was a British effort, but it, he was uh, one of the British Canadians, yeah. one of the Black Canadians. Uh, and no, they didn't always work out well. That was difficult. And a, yeah. Well, and you know, it's I mean, the whole world that he grew up in that he wanted to go back to might not have been there anymore because of the chaos and the warfare that was going on there. Well, and ultimately, we're still talking about you know trying to put them back in a land that uh, there are people still living there, and they yeah. might not necessarily you know yeah, just trying you, to you, kind you of won't necessarily got to run into a friend, or they might not necessarily want to just give you back your yeah. <laughs> your house. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean that's that's a it's a difficult journey both ways you know it's yeah. it's a, but so hard to imagine being ripped away from your childhood and in such a terrible way yeah absolutely uh, and then uh, you know planning to go back to a place that might not even exist anymore I mean it's I mean that that's a that's a plot line of a dystopian science fiction movie yeah and, but it was really what happened to people yeah. and I think I think it's just such an incredibly special thing that we were I mean and even with the tragedies uh, that are you know that are inherent in this story hearing it and knowing i mean you know this is it's a human story it is. and it's there there are stories of this that you know you could look through all throughout all kinds of history of people who've been it's ripped from their homes definitely an example of a person whose spirit endured yeah despite all these terrible things that happened to him. yeah and he he made a life here yeah. uh, despite despite his i mean i'm sure he faced lots of problems here too yeah. and i just some of the some of the parts that are actually almost a bit amusing is the very yeah. simple way that he will give you a, a life lesson you know yeah. too little can be bad but too much can be bad also and the way yeah. that he says that and the in the terminology of it uh it is i mean it is it, there's a reason that uh, his culture should have been preserved and yeah. he's glad that we that it's it's a it's a great thing 
and were able to at least retrieve this piece of it yeah. through this extraordinary person who has an extraordinary life. And of course, it's it's only a small part of a of you know this larger tapestry, yeah. but it's it's. It's an important yeah, actually, part, I mean, too. How many, I mean, millions yeah. of those same stories of people who were somehow taken from their homeland and ended up here that were lost. Yeah. You know, that this voice uh, in there at least gives some voice to those, you know, those millions. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? You know, I, I was watching one called The Joy of Data. It's a series, you know, and there's, uh, there's this extraordinary woman, Dr. Hannah Fry. She, uh, the, I mean, the series reminds me uh, a lot of, like, the old Connections series. But, I mean, she's just got a great kind of wit to it, uh, and uh, they tie together a bunch of disparate things. But it's all about how data is gathered and collected and used. And, uh, I mean, it was really fascinating to watch. And, you know, like, they, they wander over to a dairy farmer, and, uh, you know, he's trying to figure out when's the best time to impregnate his cattle. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, you think of data as being this high tech thing, and she brings it down to where it's being actually applied in the real world. It's a lot of fun to watch. It's really very entertaining. It connects a bunch of different things, which is kind of we do that sometimes on the History Guy. I enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, and uh, you know, again, you know, there's such a variety of stuff that you find on Magellan TV. What have you been watching lately on Magellan TV? And so one of the ones I watched recently is called Hunters of the Skies, and it's about uh, it's about birds of prey. But one of the things that I thought was interesting about it is uh, it's about European birds of prey. And that's I, it's just not something I'd thought a lot about. But it goes over all these various eagles and a lot about the goshawk and various these animals that the goshawk hunts other birds <laughs> and is incredibly fast. And they, have, as always, they've got incredible footage of these, these birds flying around and of babies in the nests and stuff. And of course... It's a nature documentary. There's there's some sadness. <laughs> Various well, <laughs> nature every gets time, a bit brutal. Yeah. Every time they show show a cute little little mammal, and they're like, oh, but this is the prey of the, <laughs> <laughs> the bird's gonna eat that. <laughs> Unless you think the bunny's cute before it becomes dinner. Is well, that, uh, yeah. yeah, there's one. Well, one of them that this this eagle or hawk kills it kills like a baby fox. And uh, first oh of all, my like, goodness, wow, baby like, foxes are very cute. Yeah, yeah, that that was a little. But so. If 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 you're you know if you're if that makes you too sad you might steer away from it. But in terms of you know interesting things about birds and how nature really works because I mean that's what we're talking about. It's it was a really really interesting uh, documentary and of course I just loved the shots on it and they have all kinds of I mean, these birds move so fast you have to do it in slow motion but mm -hmm. you get shots of birds that you know you'll never see yourself because they're able to get so up and close up yeah, so close and personal. One of the things I love about Magellan TV, if you want to watch a nature documentary, it's the best. If you want to watch history, it's the best. If you want to watch science, it's the best. If you want to watch true crime, it's the best. There's just so many things to see. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes you want to, you, you, those, it's fantastic even just to see someone goes out in the wild and takes that kind of video. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash historyguy where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next up, the history guy tells the story of Oda Banga. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the history guy. In September 1905, visitors to the Bronx Zoo found a new exhibit. Standing in the corner of a cage in the monkey house was not an animal, but a young man dressed in a loincloth and carrying a bow and arrow. Later on, bones would be scattered about the bottom of the cage to add to the atmosphere. A sign was hung which read, The African Pygmy, Oda Benga, age 23, height 4 foot 11 inches, 103 pounds, brought from the Kasai River, Congo Free State, South Central Africa, by Dr. Samuel P. Werner, exhibited each afternoon in September. Oda Benga would be tormented for days in the Bronx Zoo, chased when he was allowed out of his cage or gawked at behind bars. While many of the details of his life are uncertain, what we do know of Oda Benga is that he was a man who suffered much at the hands of fellow men. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In the often contradictory reports of his life, it's unclear when Benga was born. Measuring from the 23 years given in 1906, he was born in 1883, but his age was reported inconsistently, with some suggesting that he was only 15 in 1906. No record exists of his birth, his family, or relatives, and it's not even clear what tribe he belonged to. He was often called a Bambuti, an ethnic group of Central African pygmy peoples from Central Africa in the northeastern part of the modern Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
all share a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and live in the rainforest of Central Africa. Whenever he was born, he was born into one of the worst examples of colonial exploitation in history. Belgian King Leopold II had secured Congo as his own personal land, and under a brutal regime forced the natives to supply goods such as rubber. Belgian officials led thousands of local Congolese as the Force Publique, which enforced rubber quotas by torturing and mutilating the indigenous people as official policy. Between killings, starvation, and sickness, millions of Congolese died between 1885 and 1908. Brutal killings were common, and it isn't known what kind of trauma Benga suffered in his early life. Benga first enters the written record in 1906, when he was found by Samuel Phillips Werner, a former missionary and aspiring adventurer and scientist. Werner had already been to Africa for a time as a missionary, but got sidetracked by his interest in African artifacts and locals, eventually being recalled in 1899. He returned to America with two orphan Congolese boys and a desire to become a renowned scientist and anthropologist. One of the boys died in 1902. Werner himself was prone to mental breakdowns with hallucinations and spent several stints in sanatoriums. He returned to Africa in 1904 on a mission from William John McGee, a prominent ethnologist who was organizing ethnographic exhibitions for the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition, commonly called the St. Louis World's Fair. McGee was preparing a number of exhibits using indigenous peoples, including Ainu from Japan, Native Americans, including the captured Geronimo, and African pygmies. Werner volunteered his expertise and was tasked with gathering 18 indigenous Central Africans as well as cultural items. After extensive preparation, Werner reported on March 20th, 1904, that the first pygmy has been secured. The man he secured was Oda Benga. Werner would eventually give many descriptions as to how he found Benga, but in his initial report he said that he found Benga held captive at a remote village and bought him for, with some salt and cloth. He was, however, known to be near Basongo, a noted slave market. It wasn't until a later report from Harper's Weekly that Werner first claimed to have rescued Benga from a tribe of cannibals, saying he was delighted to come with us. His stories quickly multiplied. He told the Columbus Dispatch that he had met Benga with some of his tribesmates from a nearby village and negotiated with the chief for Benga to join him. Yet another telling said that he had been captured by a rival tribe and then captured by Belgian forces, where Werner found him. At least one story claims Benga had a wife and two children who were killed either by Belgian forces or raided by another tribe. About the only constant in the many retellings by Werner and others were the presence of cannibals and that Werner was a savior. The exact circumstances around Benga and the eight other boys who joined him on his trip to the World Fair can't be known. Werner claimed that many had promised to come but subsequently gave way to their fears and only by giving them salt and guns could he convince anyone to come along. Endemic violence may have given them ample reason to wish for an escape, but Werner was also in a position to buy or otherwise threaten compliance as well. It took Werner another three months to get his charges to America, just in time for Werner to have another nervous breakdown. He checked into a sanatorium, and the boys, according to the manifest, the youngest was 12 and Oda Benga was 17, were sent along to the fair. They were sent two months late for the opening, but arrived near the end of June to considerable fanfare. Some 10,000 natives from around the world were exhibited in St. Louis, and even before the fair, officials had decided that any deaths among those exhibited would be kept for scientific study. The Smithsonian was to get, whenever possible, the brains of the deceased, while the rest of the body was distributed to other museums and institutions. The Africans were incredibly popular and quickly learned to perform for the crowds, shooting arrows and doing dances. Benga was especially popular, in part because he charged a nickel to show his teeth, which had been chipped into points as a kind of cultural body modification. He was also heralded in the press as a little fellow who narrowly escaped being eaten by cannibals. Some reported that his teeth were sharpened specifically to eat flesh. Quickly, however, they tired of the attention because they were constantly poked and prodded, and their pets taunted and their privacy ignored. The fair officials were aware of their discomfort but did nothing about it. The Africans were also studied and measured, and scientists made plaster casts of their faces. By August 5th, when Werner finally reached the fair, they wanted to go home. At the end of the fair, each was given 15 cents for their participation. Werner was given the gold medal for anthropology. Geronimo was said to be particularly taken with Benga, to whom he gave an arrowhead. By the summer of 1905, Werner and his charges were back in the Congo. Werner claims during this period that he and Benga became friends and that Benga accompanied him on trips as he gathered more artifacts and sought minerals and other natural resources that Werner hoped to profit from.
According to Werner, when he was prepared to return to the United States in 1906, Benga asked to accompany him. Again, the story was told in many different versions. In one, he said that Benga threatened to kill himself if Werner didn't take him with him. And in another, Werner said that he thought that Benga was simply going to be re-enslaved, and so he took him with him to protect him. But no account from Benga exists to explain why he returned to the United States. And it's quite possible that Werner merely saw the opportunity for profit. The pair, along with artifacts and two chimpanzees, arrived in New York in July. Werner went to the American Museum of Natural History, where he attempted to get employment and negotiated for Benga and the chimpanzees to remain with the museum director, Herman Bumpus. At first, Bumpus enjoyed having Benga at the museum, but soon began sending letters to Werner informing him that Benga was restless. He had attempted to escape the museum and had thrown a chair. Werner was having money problems. He was dodging an arrest warrant for a bad check, and eventually the artifacts left at the museum were all impounded. Fortunately for Bumpus, Werner arrived to take charge of Benga shortly after. He'd found Benga, a new home. On Saturday, September 8, 1906, the director of the New York Zoological Gardens, William Hornaday, directed visitors to what he said was his best attraction yet, caged in the primate house. Days earlier, Werner had asked Hornaday to house his chimpanzees and, of course, Oda Benga. Hornaday was ecstatic, and in an article published the next month, Hornaday described Benga as a well-developed little man who was quite pleased with his temporary quarters. He was an instant spectacle. The New York Times reported that the man who occasionally shared his cage with an orangutan was a bushman, one of a race that scientists do not rate high in the human scale. While it made some uncomfortable, the exhibit was approved by Hornaday, a well-respected zoologist, as well as the prestigious members of the zoo board. For New Yorkers, it was a cheap afternoon thrill. Admittance was free at the zoo five days a week. Hornaday pointed to earlier human exhibitions in Europe and claimed he was displayed only for scientific interest. He said Benga was only with the apes because that's the most comfortable place we could find for him and that it was one of the best rooms in the primate house. The press reported that he made mats to sell and did tricks with his bow and arrow, which he made himself. It was also reported that he was obsessed with money for photographs, which the papers thought he was going to use to buy a wife when he returned to Africa. He was also said to be fond of ice cream sodas. Later, Hornaday and others would claim Benga was employed at the zoo and that he stayed in the exhibits of his own free will. However, the working title for an article he wrote about Benga was an exhibition at the New York Zoological Gardens. Massive crowds seemed to vindicate his earlier excitement, and Benga was moved to a different cage, where keepers had spread bones out to capitalize on his cannibalism. Not all were happy about the exhibit. A group of black ministers were furious. We think we are worthy of being considered human beings with souls, said Reverend James Gordon. Werner claimed that Benga is absolutely free and that he was kept by the keepers for his own safety, as Benga was not fully responsible for his own acts. Another article said whoever put on the exhibit degrades himself as much as he does the African. Others met the Fuhrer with a surprising indifference. A New York Times op-ed brushed aside the idea that Benga should be educated as the idea that men are all much alike except as they have or had lacked opportunities for getting an education of books is now far out of date. While Benga's humanhood and freedom were battled out in the press, the zoo began seeking ways to make it less obvious that Benga was on display. The ministers appealed to the New York City mayor, who wouldn't see them, and Madison Grant, secretary of the Zoological Society, later a noted eugenicist and often quoted by Hitler, who brushed them off. Many papers defended Hornaday and Werner, who they insisted were victims of well-meaning but foolish protests. His every move was reported on daily and nationwide. In Los Angeles, a paper reported Benga could speak to orangutans. Reporters the world over wanted pictures, and one Frenchman even asked how much Benga was being sold for. Attendance at the park doubled compared to the same month a year earlier. Meanwhile, Benga grew tired of his captivity. He became combative, and Hornaday said he was hard to manage. Hornaday was confused when Benga refused to return to the monkey cage, and when he threatened to bite his keepers when they tried to force him. He remarked that Benga was an untamed ebony bunch of bother. Eight days after his initial unveiling, Benga was allowed to roam the park, but he was constantly swamped by hordes of visitors, howling, jeering, and yelling. Crowds were too much for the park keepers, and Benga struck a number of visitors as they chased him. Relentlessly pursued, he even shot one with his bow and arrow. On September 24th, he brandished a carving knife, and it took three keepers to disarm him. It was likely to everyone's relief when, in October, he was quietly removed and given to the care of Reverend Gordon's orphan asylum. Though Werner would offer to bring Benga back to Africa, Benga refused ever again to see the man who had taken him from his home. At the asylum, he learned to read and write and was sent to a farm to work.
Eventually, he abandoned the program and sought to raise his own money, apparently hoping to book passage back to Africa on his own. In 1910, he moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, home to the Virginia Theological Seminary. It was reported that he would return to Africa as a missionary. He lived with a black family in Lynchburg and took some courses at the seminary. He became friends with Ann Spencer, a teacher who would later become a prominent poet of the Harlem Renaissance. In Lynchburg, he was called Oda Bingo, and his teeth were capped. Benga seems to have relatively enjoyed his time in Lynchburg, where he told local children about his home and how to spearfish. Sometimes they watched him dance and sing around a fire. Still, by 1916, after six years of trying to earn money to get home, he seems to have grown melancholy. He stopped playing with the children and spent hours alone under a tree singing, I believe I'll go home, Lordy. Won't you help me? It had been ten years since he'd last seen Africa. On March 19th, 1916, Benga was seen collecting wood. He started a fire that evening in a field near Mary Ellen's house, where he again danced and sang. That night, he entered a shed and retrieved a gun that he had hidden there. He shot himself through the heart. The Lynchburg News reported that, for a long time, the young man pined for his African relations and grew morose when he realized that such a trip was out of the question because of the lack of resources. He was buried at the city cemetery, surrounded by the family that he had found there. In the years that followed, everybody involved in the Oda Benga story went to defend themselves. Hornaday insisted that Oda Benga stayed in the park because he was well treated. Werner continually insisted that he was Oda Benga's friend and rescuer. And papers suggested that Oda Benga killed himself because he couldn't deal with the white man's magic and civilization. But we have very little record of what Oda Benga himself thought of his own life story, whether he saw Werner as a friend or as a villain, why he returned to the United States a second time. What is clear is that Oda Benga was a victim of exploitation, depending upon the story possibly at the hands of fellow Africans, but certainly at the hands of the Belgians, of Werner, of Hornaday. Oda Benga's life story is distressingly lacking the voice of Oda Benga, and yet it still deserves to be remembered. And one of the things that we can do as historians is give voice to the voiceless. And in that legacy, offer a dignity that they might have been denied in life. So, so I mean, the connecting piece between these two stories is, is really despite their long separation of time, because of course they, they well, I mean, I guess to, they cross over each other too. When we talk about mm -hmm. Oluwale in, in 1860 and then Otabanga in 1906, you know, mm -hmm. when he's first picked up, uh, that it's really about how, I mean, it's about this exploitation. It is, yeah. It, I mean, and they're both, you know, they were both ripped yeah. from their uh, homes. Uh, they were both ripped from their homes in a, in a source of chaos. They yeah. both eventually pined for returning to their homes, weren't able to. So there's yeah. some certain similarities between them. Uh, and, and then the way that's stunning. Because uh, 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 Uwe Kizulu was, yeah. I mean, that was clear at the end of the slavery era. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you'd like to think that, that you wouldn't have anything even similar to that still. You yeah. know, 50 30 years or 50 years, years later, later, you know, in the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, of course, the slavery still continues today. I think That's a lot of people too. will mention that. But I mean, but the idea that this was still very close to the middle passage that happens to Oda Benga. Yeah. In some ways, completely different and in some ways, so similar. Yes. And it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting story. I, I do want to mention, you know, one of the sources that I used for this was a book and it's called Spectacle. The Astonishing Life of Oda Banga, and it's by Pamela Newkirk. It's, it's you know, our, our videos are short, and uh, there's a lot more detail in there. It's interesting how you try to piece together someone's history, especially because one of the things that, you know, differentiates this one from uh, Oluwale is that uh, we don't have his voice, and we don't have anything from uh, Banga himself. We don't himself. have this long interview with Oda yeah. Banga. We're all hearing what other people said about him. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the things that makes this kind of a complex story, because there's so much we don't we don't know about how, you know, Otobanga felt or how he lived his life. I, I, I think that it's one of the things that's interesting is it's, this was kind of, it was kind of late in the professionalization of uh, so many sciences, mm -hmm. but I, you know, the, the, the world's fair there where they had 10,000 mm -hmm. natives from various places. Yeah, and so we're talking about how videos overlap because yeah. I talked about the 1904 Olympics before. Yeah. yeah. And they actually had a separate Olympics for the, for the natives that they were there <laughs> where they had things like mud throwing and pole climbing. Uh, Yikes. but I mean, and, but, but actually two, two guys that were there for the, the, you know, the, the human zoos yeah. ran in the marathon 
at the at the Olympics. And one of them probably would have won, but he was chased by dogs about a mile off tracks. You know, next <laughs> mile. That is that that's a story too. The whole the whole uh, I don't know if we should laugh at that or not about being oh, chased by dogs. That's actually fair. But yeah, because it was a ten, the whole won. the whole story of that uh, that particular marathon was just a disaster. But uh, it's it's interesting to see that overlap. And you know to think about how that time at the same time that we're having the World Fair and modern Olympics. That we still yeah. think that it's cool to shove, you know, captured, you know, pygmies from some yeah. Central Africa and, and, and make them an exhibit yeah. or to exhibit Geronimo. Yeah. And, and at the time, that was considered scientific as well yeah. as entertainment. Uh, and that's the, I mean, the real story when you talk about the whole life of Oda Benge is, is, you know, did we really think this was right to have a guy yeah. in the monkey cage? And they actually, that is a very, uh, you know, in-depth discussion at the time and they really are talking in the newspapers and among people and stuff like is this right is this not right is this in his best interest is this not in his best interest yeah. uh, and and that that was you know they were really actually having to consent so i mean today you're like what you know yeah what how, how can no, you have this no it's not okay to have him in the cage uh, and at the time that that was still a point of discussion when you talk about how much maybe life has changed since 1905 yeah. uh you can talk about you know computers or whatever you want to talk about but you can also talk about there's just a different world sensibility yeah uh, but you know, it's still quite possible to become a slave uh, in various yeah. different kinds of ways uh, in 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 human culture, and you know, we're not past it. No, uh, you know, in this, it, it is interesting that this this was ethnography, this was anthropology, this was, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, you know, nowadays there's a reason we don't do things this way anymore, and that's partially because I mean, for one, it's bad science. Yes, uh, I I, there, I don't know what we were learning necessarily from you know Oda Banga taking a nickel to show his teeth. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it was we're trying to even you know believe in our new vision of a modern world, an industrial yeah. world that the people could still live that way, and and uh, yeah, what. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, today you do that ethnography in a village, yeah. And you have to wonder how much are you changed. I think we still probably will have questions. Like a hundred yeah. years from now, we're probably asking about how we how we do that today. and how we affected and impacted the. But yeah. that, that's that's a real question with with Odabanga is that you know how much do we learn about his culture when uh, we remove him from it? And to yeah. be quite honest, when we spend so little time asking him about it, yeah, you know? no one ever <laughs> got no one ever sat down and said, "Tell me your story." So, I mean, how much did we honestly care about learning about the life of Otabenga that we put him in the Bronx Zoo, yeah. but we never had someone sit down and say, tell me what happened to you, so that we even yeah. got a clear story about what he thought about the guy that brought him, who claimed to have been his savior, and it's, brought him from Africa. It's such it's such a difficult, because, I mean, maybe uh, Werner was a hero and did save him from some situation. It's he truly... You... I mean, I mean, he, he has all sorts of selfish reasons to say yeah. that. It doesn't necessarily mean, again, we don't know Otto Bengo never told a story. It's it's hard to believe anything Werner said because he was constantly changing his story. Yeah, it was, it was, it was clearly self-serving. Yeah. I, I mean that that that's uh, that's without a doubt, and yet, and I we I honestly don't know that that means that you know some version of his story wasn't true, uh, but he might have. I mean, he might have just bought out a bank at a slave market. Well, we know at the time that there that that there were people that were actually going off into Africa to grab uh, you know native peoples to display, and yeah. that that you know even though, though that was criminal, I mean they were they were certainly doing it. Uh, and actually, it's when we talk about overlaps, but there's a story about that. And we, we told the story of the Okapi, of the discovery of the Okapi. Yeah. And Sir Harry Johnston, who was this British uh, 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 official in, in, in Africa, and the way one of the ways he discovered the Okapi is that they had captured a guy who had captured some pygmies. Uh, hmm. And they, you know, he was tried, but they, they uh, Harry Johnston took charge of these five pygmies to take them back to their home. And he, uh, which he successfully did. Kind of, they were still in Africa. It's a different story, but yeah. But I mean, that you know, that tells you. I mean, there was there was, this was a German dude who was in the Belgian Congo yeah. hunting pygmies because he knew that they could be sold to human zoos. So I mean, we don't know if he bought him from a slave trade. No. We don't know if he paid someone to enslave him. Uh, we, you know, and if he bought him from a from a, a slave center, maybe you know, maybe he had a better life. Than he would be. It's true. Maybe uh, maybe that is. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's a legitimate question throughout Oda Benga's life. Is like you know, was is this. Was he there because he wanted the adventure? Was he there because that was the place, place, place that he was going to be? Or was it as horrible as it might seem? You know, we really yeah. don't know. Again, we don't, we miss his story. Yeah. But there's no way to look at it and say this is a way to treat people. Uh, yeah. No, right? I mean, ultimately, I, I, his, this, the whole story is a tragedy. And I, he lived a 
hard life. Uh, no did. matter what else, no matter what part of those is true, is that he and he's struggled. clearly never found ha happiness. Clearly yeah. never found satisfaction. Clearly never found a place where he was truly accepted. Maybe more towards the end, you know, with the church. Yeah. But I mean, he, you know, and he was another one, like Kazula, that wanted to be back, you know, where he started, and yeah. there might not have been any way to get there. Yeah. But uh, but I mean, he's did, he's what, what he's, he's planning for a life that he that was taken from him. Yeah. And so it is. I mean, it it seems a horrible story throughout. I mean, there's points in it. Where it's almost a bit, you know, comic, the antics yeah. that he would play. There's points of it where you wonder if he was having some agency over what's happening to him, though it's not really clear. Uh, but it's, but I mean, the whole of it is that this is this is a person who was, you know, ripped from where he wanted to be and never could be back where he wanted to be again. And never, unlike uh, 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 Kasula, he never found, yeah. he never found happiness or family or, or any of that sort of peace. And, uh, you know, it would, certainly would have been interesting at least to hear him explain you know or you know tell his yeah. story and see what what he thought of the whole of the whole story yeah i i do wonder i think i mean it's telling that he never wanted to see Werner again after he got free absolutely of that's got to be yeah well and you know it's telling that he committed suicide in the it's end, also yeah. true yeah and it's it's a hard it's a hard story because you want there to be a happy ending for him and there's uh, there's just not and to be honest not. you wonder i mean you wonder if there ever was if he could have gotten back to africa would he would he have found any place there and it's the same as you know as Casola's story is that would would he have found a place where he could find happiness among you know people who are at least within his same culture or i mean he was that was still the belgian oh, congo it? so and he certainly he was certainly not someone who wanted to come here and be civilized i mean he didn't no. like he wanted to be who he was but I mean, you know, putting bones in his cage to make him look like a cannibal and stuff like that. There's I mean, some just, real clear. He was yeah. clearly being treated like an animal. Yeah. There's, there's just no excuse for that. You know, there's a story of uh, the Beagle on its first voyage uh, grabbed. So Darwin wasn't on the first voyage, but the Beagle, the Beagle on its first voyage went to Patagonia, and they grabbed a bunch of. They grabbed like five dudes, just natives, uh, you know, kidnapped them, put them on a boat, yep. took them back to 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 England, and what they tried to do is to civilize them, treat them to be mer uh, to be missionaries. And take them back to Patagonia and have them and have them civilize the people of Patagonia. Which gosh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a little, bit, but it's interesting because one of Darwin talked to me. Says he's a really intelligent guy. He's a really nice guy. And as soon as they got there, he threw off his clothes and <laughs> <laughs> went back to live in his life. So he was apparently smart enough to play their game long enough to get them to yeah. drop him off back at home. Because that's probably yeah. Yeah, mean... yeah, so he clearly was never on board with their whole plan. But. Uh, uh, so this is, I mean, this went on. It went on for a very yeah. long period of time. There's more. There's more stories than this. And of course, yeah. you wonder what all happened at the at the World's Fair. I mean, it's, it's clear some of the people that were in those were. I mean, they were just playing a role. I mean, yeah. they were. You know, they had they hadn't lived that life in a long time, and and some of it was all you know just theater. Uh, but I mean, what happened to all those thousand people yeah. that were taken there to be displayed as if they're animals? Uh, and you know we have a good story about Abenga, but I mean uh, not you know again so much of it's lost because it's not how much we might have learned about his culture too, which is still not very well known. But uh, but I mean how many stories? There were a thousand of those at least yeah. at the at the World's Fair, and those are you know those are stories that we don't have a book on. And I, you have to, you, I mean, in terms of what we could have learned from them at the fair, you know they they had like huts for him there. Who has any idea if those huts even? close even even oh, yeah, possibly yeah. resembled what they were actually living in uh, some of that was just this this idea of of you know what people think their life is like in africa and, and, and i think some of those that were just laughing about being you know paid to do this yeah. uh, but i there had to have been others that were stolen from their yeah. from their world and it, for for nobody would it have been I mean, I just imagine just being displayed like that yeah. people gawking at you like you're you know like you're in the monkey cage. and it's it's clear that uh whatever they found you know whatever enjoyment or agency they did find in it uh, they got sick of it and yeah. you you see that with banga both you know at the world's fair when they're like we're sick of people poking us and, and you yeah. see it when at the bronx zoo too where yeah. he starts you know attacking yeah, they, people. They, they, they learn, oh, he can't even just wander the zoo without people yeah. treating him like he's an animal that's escaped a cage yeah uh, so it's i mean that the, the the real tragedy throughout about a banga is that he never did find his place yeah so we don't know how he was originally taken from his place by slavers or whatever uh, but we know that he never found a place that seemed home to him yeah. and and that's that's just an awful tragedy yeah it, it, it truly is and and like you I mean like you'd say at the end of this story that the one of the biggest tragedies is that we just never hear from him yeah and it's it's incredible because it sure seems like there were some opportunities to and we just never got to we never we never got to hear his side of the story maybe he didn't maybe he didn't want to tell it you know, but, uh, that's also true which I, I mean 
that's something you got to give some agency at least for too. There's a lot of lost history in the story yeah. of Otabenge, and that we never we have all these people that are saying all the you know for their own purposes, yeah. saying all these things about his story, and we never hear from him. How did he get there? You know, why did he come back from Africa? Was was he was he kidnapped? Did he just you know want to come back and but still want to go home? Or I mean, yeah. I, but you can certainly see why, no matter how it all happened, why later in life he just you know he wishes he'd go back to see his family, his friend. He never saw them again. And we don't know. We don't know who they were. We don't know what he was wanted to go back home for. He was a full person in there, and we don't get to know who mm -hmm. he was. And that's that's true of a, of an awful lot of people in history. Yeah, I mean, you know, we never really knew much more about him than the you know the exhibit in the cage. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got maybe that much of a caricature about it. Yeah. We have a few stories of him at like when he was living with with that family before he died, and I there small and it's it's not enough to really know who he was as a person i doubt he would open up to them even know that much yeah. it's awfully it's, difficult to especially after so long of uh, getting passed around you don't want to yeah who would you who would you trust yeah and these stories honestly these stories are hard to tell yeah i mean we we do a lot of history on the history guy and we do you know we do some fairly light history and some stuff that's really really heavy and, and a lot of different stuff and you know i love that i love you know that we do different chunks of history but certainly there are stories that are harder to tell but i mean it's history that deserves to be remembered uh because uh, how can we ever learn from history if we don't if we don't know history yeah and it just the you know the idea of what his life was like uh, hopefully will modify how we live our lives now how we set the standards for how we're supposed to behave and you know, there's a lesson. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.